Did you know Utah was the first place a woman cast a legal ballot in the United States? It was on February 14th, 1870, that women's opinions and preferences were first officially included in the political process. A band played outside the council hall building, which sits right here in downtown Salt Lake City. As Seraph Young, a school teacher, cast the first official female ballot in the nation. The movement to give women the right to vote in political elections, the suffrage movement, found one of its first great triumphs right here in Utah. Here's another example of how Utah led the way in women's advocacy in the 19th century. In 1896, Utah elected the first female state senator in the nation. Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon won the Senate seat in the first election open to female candidates, and she ran against and beat her own husband in the race. <laughs> These examples are not anomalies. From that first vote in 1870, Utah was on the leading edge of women's advocacy in the country. Consider these other examples. Susan B. Anthony, the most famous suffragist in America in the 19th century, visited Utah on a number of occasions to congratulate the women of Utah on their pioneering accomplishments. Through these visits, she developed warm friendships with the Utah suffragists, corresponded with them regularly, and invited them to participate in conferences in the East. Utah's leading suffragist, Emmeline B. Wells, became such a good friend of Anthony's that on her deathbed, Anthony bequeathed Wells her gold ring as a symbol of their 40-year friendship. Emmeline Wells herself edited a newspaper for 36 years called The Woman's Exponent. Through thousands of editorials, Emmeline and her staff drove forward the women's rights movement. And The Woman's Exponent ended up being one of the, of the longest-running suffrage newspapers in the country. Utah women pioneered advancements in business and medicine, as well as in political engagement. The women of Utah raised silkworms, and they made silk, and they sold the fabric to provide for themselves and their families. On the occasion of Susan B. Anthony's 80th birthday, Utah women gave her a dress made of black Utah silk, and Susan B. Anthony declared it her favorite piece of clothing because it was made by free women. The dress sits today in Anthony's bedroom in the Susan B. Anthony House and Museum in Rochester, New York. The Deseret Hospital was one of the only all-female-led hospitals in the nation. Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon was its lead physician, and the other physicians were also women trained at East Coast Medical Colleges. And in 1919, when the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, visited Utah for the first time, there was one person he wanted to meet. Emmeline Wells. She was one of the most famous people in Utah at the time, not only because of her work in suffrage, but because she had spearheaded a program of saving wheat that had resulted in the largest sale of grain to the United States government during World War I. And it wasn't just women who were passionate about moving forward the women's movement. Joseph F. Smith lectured on the evils of paying a woman less than a man for doing the same job. And legislator Orson F. Whitney said that the women's movement was going to be the great leveler by which the Almighty is lifting up this fallen world. This is our remarkable legacy as Utahns. This is the work and these are the attitudes upon which our state was founded. When Utah joined the nation as a state in 1895, legislator Franklin S. Richards said that the work done in Utah on behalf of women would prove to be the brightest and purest ray of Utah's glorious star, lifting its sister states upward and onward to the higher plane of civilization and the fuller measure of civil and religious liberty. But is this how we think of ourselves as Utahns today? Have we done justice to the vision of our state's founders by continuing to make Utah a place that's dedicated to the advancement of women? Sadly, the answer is no. When it comes to our identity as a state today, we carry a burden, not a glowing legacy. As I was sharing these stories from our past, this might have been what came to your mind. 
Research has identified Utah as one of the worst places for women in the country based on metrics of workplace environment, political engagement, health, and education. Ironically, Utah has one of the lowest rates of female voter turnout of any state in the nation. And our wage gap puts us at the bottom, meaning that our women make the least amount of money per dollar made by a man for doing the same job. Utah has gone from being at the leading edge of women's advocacy in the 19th century to the trailing edge in the 21st. What would the founders of our state think of us today? As I share these stories from our past with those who are not already familiar with them, I see a light come into their eyes. A smile spreads across their face, and I know this feeling well. I remember those first moments when I realized the tremendous pride I could take in being a Utah woman. I moved here nine years ago from New York City, where I was born and raised. I'm a Mormon, so the name of, of some of the Utah suffragists were familiar to me, but only in the context of their church calling or their husband's position in the church. But it was when I was reading a biography of Emmeline Wells that I had the awakening I see in so many others today. How had I not known these stories? How was this not part of our state's identity, its, its brand? When I had moved here, friends in New York had laughed and told jokes that would be taboo about any other place or people. And yet here we are, sitting on a treasured past that could silence much of that mockery. Utah has lost its identity as a place where women's advocacy thrives in the 150 years since that first female vote in the Council Hall building. And what is the lesson? of Utah's experience. The lesson is that any triumphs, any rights won, any paths forged on behalf of women can backslide without vigilance in telling the stories of the people and the places and the events that mattered in the fight, without an understanding of what we rose from and what we came from, societies can lose what previous generations fought for. The reasons for Utah's dramatic pendulum swing in the area of women's advocacy are diverse and complicated. When the pioneers of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints first entered the Salt Lake Valley, they brought with them a willingness to participate in dramatic social experiments that were peculiar to antebellum America. It was this willingness to revolutionize society that led to their overwhelming support for the women's movement. They felt that women's emancipation was a natural continuation of their religious revolution. But this willingness to revolutionize society brought with it the most dramatic social experiment of all, polygamy or plural marriage, where one man had more than one wife. Polygamy is an essential and complicated part of any story from Utah women's history. It allowed a fragile young community to thrive in a new desert home. It perpetuated families and quickly grew a vital population. It brought inconceivable loneliness and heartache and spiritual confusion into many private hearts. It alienated the community from the rest of the country at a steep social cost. But for some women, like Emmeline Wells and Dr. Cannon, polygamy demanded that they speak up for themselves. It demanded that they provide for themselves and their families financially, and it demanded that they create identities for themselves outside that of wife and mother. Polygamy has been a thorn in the side of the Latter-day Saints throughout the 20th century as the church has struggled with its after effects, even though the practice was officially disbanded in 1891. Members of the church have responded in part with shame, part with a desire to shush any exploration of this strange practice, but the result is that we have shushed the stories of women as well. We have silenced the women of the past and lost their stories, because we identify them not as the leaders and innovators they were, but first and foremost, as polygamous wives. Instead of relieving them from the burden of their painful polygamous marriages, we have buried them in it. And it is time for us to stop being complicit in silencing our sisters of the past because of their marital status. Another reason for Utah's dramatic pendulum shift is that the women's movement took on a particular political agenda in the 20th century that was out of line with the increasingly global and conservative LDS church. And so while Emmeline Wells is known in the church for her time as the global president of the Relief Society, the women's organization, praising her as a suffrage advocate and progressive political activist became less and less attractive. 
the stories of Emmeline Wells and her Utah suffragists no longer provided a convenient narrative. But pointing to the social and political evolutions of the LDS church is also only part of the story. Many Utah women in, in the 19th century were not Mormon and were still caught up in the fervor that defined our young state. Fanny Brooks, for instance, was a pillar of the business community and a keen negotiator with Brigham Young. Jenny Froiseth started a retirement home for women that is still part of our community today. Zikala Sa was a dynamic advocate for Native women's rights, which were largely ignored among the movement's triumphs. And Emma McVicker was an early proponent of the kindergarten movement and started the Neighborhood House, also an essential part of our community today. Their stories, too, have largely been forgotten. And why do their stories matter? Because knowing where we come from as a community is essential to crafting our identities in the future. We have forgotten these women, we've forgotten their stories, and as a result, we've forgotten what they fought for. But knowing that the early members of our community cared so deeply about the emancipation and development of women here gives us a legacy we need to do a better job of honoring. They've given us a precedent for making Utah a place dedicated to women's advocacy. They've forged it into our DNA. They've shown us the way. They've given us permission to make Utah that place once again. Since my awakening to my new home's remarkable history, I have found a whole new side of Utah to love and to call my own. Utah women pioneered advancements in political engagement, medicine, and business, and they did these things because of the support of their community, not in spite of it. This is a vision of Utah womanhood that I will proudly proclaim. The year 2020 marks the 150th anniversary of that first vote in the Council Hall building. That year, the rest of the nation will also be celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which extended women's voting rights through the country. These anniversaries and my awakening to my new home's remarkable history prompted me to start Better Days 2020, a nonprofit that popularizes Utah women's history through education, legislation, and art. In creative and communal ways, Better Days 2020 is reminding us that Utah led the way. We can lead again. We can start by telling the stories of these women in our schools and in our churches and in our homes. We can embrace their complexity and their humanness. In politics and business, we can clear paths for our women to complete their educations, provide for their families, and get the childcare support they need to make their lives work. We can encourage our women to take on meaningful and purposeful work, and we can use technology to create flexible and accommodating schedules for women's increasingly demanding lives. We can create a culture where our sisters and our wives and our daughters and our friends feel empowered to go back to school, run for political office, and ask for a promotion. There are... <laughs> there are wonderful organizations already at play in this state to aid in this work. Real Women Run, the Women's Leadership Institute train women to run for political office. The Utah Women in Leadership Project provides valuable data that illuminates our blind spots. The companies of Silicon Slopes and other industries are trying flexible schedules, subsidized childcare, and other critical elements. Utah is a remarkable and unique place. These are the better days that the founders of our state envisioned. But there are still better days yet ahead. Join me in ensuring that the advancement of women is once again and in the future the brightest and purest ray of Utah's glorious star. Thank you. <laughs>